Professor Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School. And Noah, what an honor to have you. And you have a brand new book out that I'm fascinated by called The Arab Winter. Uh, how are you in lockdown? Thank God we're managing okay here. You know, Cambridge is very quiet, especially without students. It's a little sad, but um, you know, we're healthy and well and very fortunate. We consider ourselves fortunate to be healthy and we're also lucky to still have our jobs. You and I have known each other for about three decades. Uh, thank God you've been a very good friend uh, ever since you were a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Uh, I knew you would go, go on to great things. Um, I'm actually very proud of the fact that you did those great things in the field of academia, um, having risen to be a, a renowned constitutional scholar. Uh, you played a vital and central role in the creation of the Iraqi constitution after the American invasion of 2003. You have promoted democracy in the Arab world and uh, beyond uh, throughout your academic career. And that's what this book is about, right? Uh, the, the Arab winter. The, is it about the failure of the Arab Spring and the democratization that could or should have happened in Arab countries? Well, it's about both. It's the story of what happened after the Arab Spring. And in the main, it's a sad story because although in a remarkable effort at self-determination, people in a whole range of Arab countries tried to overthrow their dictators and in some cases did overthrow their dictators and tried to create functioning democracies, the only place where it was successful was in Tunisia. Now, if Tunisia were the only place where the Arab Spring had happened, and of course that's where it began, that would actually be a story of success. You know, it's not a huge country, it's only about 10 million people, but that's not nothing, you know, that's about the size of Israel. And Tunisia has actually successfully created a functioning democracy. It's now been functioning for seven or eight years and has had changes in government and has you know, ended the idea that Israel is the only democracy in the region. Now there's another democracy, there's Tunisia. So that's a great accomplishment. But when you look at the failures of Egypt, where the public adopted democracy and then overthrew their own democracy, or the even worse failures of Syria, where the country was cast into a terrible, brutal civil war, that led to the rise of ISIS and rape and murder and also to the displacement of, you know, six million people outside the country and other six million inside the country. Mostly it's a story of what didn't go right rather than just a story of what did go right. But what I really appreciate about your book is that you at least care that it did not go right. What has so offended me uh, in watching the, the failure of the Arab Spring is that many people are actually gloat in the fact that it failed. They're kind of satisfied with the dictatorships that have continued or that have replaced uh, democratic movements because they think that that's what's going to keep the balance of power. That's what's going to ensure that there's some kind of stability and, and, and security in the Middle East. They actually believe that democ democratization of the Arab countries is going to lead to social unrest. It's going to lead to the rise of, uh, of extremist governments or, or, or terrorist governments. And we can get, get into why some of those fears may be justified, but a lot of people are actually quite satisfied with its failure, believing that, you know, democracy is really no, has no place in the Middle East. I'm very like you. I share your sense of outrage and sorrow that there are some people who say, either I told you so, or that there's something about Arab countries that makes them incompatible with democracy, or especially when those are people who publicly advocated for democracy in the Middle East when the United States invaded Iraq and said that it was appropriate for us to invade Iraq because we would help create democracy. And then subsequently were unhappy when countries in the Arab world actually tried to democratize themselves without the United States first invading them. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a terrible position for I think anybody to be in. If you believe in democracy, you have to believe in it for its inherent value, which is the value of human beings determining their own fates. And that's very hard. And among other things, it means that a government that's truly democratic won't necessarily adopt the policies that you or I would want it to adopt. But that's the nature of democracy. If it's a dictatorship, you can cajole it, you can bribe it, you can pressure it, but you know that it isn't gonna be responsible to its own people. In contrast, if you have democratic governments, then I believe and have always believed that you can confront the basic values of the people, try to negotiate with them within some bound, but in the end you have to embrace it because it is the right thing to do, not because it produces an outcome that happens to be useful 
in one foreign policy context or in another. Let's take a step back for a moment. And by the way, Nalf, I want you to know that uh, in your honor, uh, because of my deep respect, love, and admiration for you, you are the first person for whom I put on a jacket in three months. So uh, feel, <laughs> feel, uh, um, feel respected. I was doing this interview. World that's, a, that's an honor, really. I, I appreciate that. Um, I said to myself, because I, you know, I do these, I do these Zoom, Facebook, social media broadcasts almost every single night, and they're, gosh, they're from our living rooms, and they're so casual. But in your honor, and this book was of uh, s s such significance that I wanted it to be uh, more formal, because it's a really important subject. Let's take a step back. So George W. Bush peers at, um, at Saddam Hussein, and whether it's because of unfinished business in his father's presidency or whatever other psychic drama is going on in his mind, or whether it's because he's genu genuinely outraged at the human rights abuses of Saddam Hussein, or whether it's because there, he really believes there's WMD, which turned out not to be the case, he decides we're going to invade. And, he, he, and, he, and I think he's sincere about creating democracy. And then it all kind of falls apart. Um, so many American soldiers die after, you know, the declaration of... Uh, of conquest, you know, the, the, the victory lap on, on an American um, aircraft carrier, and, and Bush is ridiculed. A huge number of Iraqis, let's not forget that. A huge number of Sorry? Iraqis died. Many, and a huge number of Iraqis died too. Which Correct, is and a huge number of innocent Iraqis who, who are slaughtered as, as, as terror organizations begin to take charge. And that leads many people around the world, but especially in the United States, who, was, who were Americans and Iraqis were paying the, the price in blood and treasure. They became very uh, cynical about democracy in, um, in Iraq uh, in particular, but more broadly in the Middle East. And they felt that Bush was uh, naive. And then the neocons who had pushed for the war because they believed that there could be a democracy and up until then there was only Israel. So where does your book leave from there? I mean, you were an integral part of it because in 2003, when the country was still very unsafe, very unstable, you actually traveled there and you helped to write or advise on the Iraqi constitution. Where does your book begin with, given that American um, cynicism and how Bush was looked down on as, as having been duped, as having been so naive to believe that he could actually create a democracy there? Well, I start by noticing that whatever disenchantment or cynicism developed in the United States, it's fascinating that Arabs themselves did not have the reaction of thinking that because of the disasters of Iraq, they couldn't have self-government in their own countries. They did not think the way some Americans think, oh, well, dictatorships are awesome. You know, they're the only solution appropriate in the Middle East. And so when you got the moment in Tunisia where a dictator was getting old and people were very frustrated and the economy was bad and people went to the streets and demanded change and the dictator left, the response throughout the Arab world was euphoria. And it was the desire to do the same thing in their own countries. And you can say, well, Tunisia is a small country, which is true, but Egypt, which is a huge, significant Arab country, the most populous Arab country, followed within a few months, within a month really, with copycat demonstrations, millions of people in the streets, calling on the government to leave, calling on Mubarak to leave, calling on the army to get him out the door. And then that actually happened. You know, the dictator of Egypt actually was escorted out the door by the military, and that led to elections. Now, there's one important point to make, which is that the protesters in Tunisia and the protesters in Egypt did not chant that they wanted democracy. They didn't use the word democracy, and they could have. They could have used the word democracy would have fit perfectly well into their chance. It even rhymes in Arabic with some of the things they did ask for. They were asking for dignity and for social justice and sometimes also for jobs or bread. So they didn't say we want democracy. What they said is we want the dictator out and we want a transformation in the way things are done in our country. But once the dictators were gone, everyone defaulted to the idea that there should be elections. And the fact that things had gone so badly in Iraq did not deter them from a from that. So one of the fascinating things to me that this shows is there is a capacity in the human spirit to stand up for yourself and to really want meaningful change from a bad government. And I consider that to be a universal human aspiration and a noble aspiration. And it's one that people can have no matter what their religion, no matter what their background, and no matter where they live. And even in the face of some evidence that suggests it'll be really hard for them once they do it. And that was, of course, the evidence of Iraq. And you know, Iraq devolved into civil war. And that's ultimately also what happened in Syria, and it's what happened in Libya, where the United States 
bomb to remove another dictator. It's what happened in Yemen. You know, civil war was a real viable possibility, and everybody knew that because they had seen they had seen a movie, they had seen the television footage, they had seen Iraq. And yet, despite that, such was the nobility of their spirit that they really wanted to do something better than live under the control of a dictator. And, and yet, your book really doesn't focus as much on human nature and the question of whether in the human breast there beats the desire to be free. It's not Jeffersonian in that way. Uh, it's, smoking, it's looking much more political realities. But you just said that it's human nature to want dignity. So how is it, if, if it is human nature, then it has to be universal. It has to be true in Kansas. It has to be true in Sydney, Australia. It has to be true in Baghdad. Uh, it has to be true in Riyadh. Uh, it has to be true in Doha. How do we wrap our heads around the fact that this one region seems to be immune to democratic movements? Again, you know, Noah, I, I really i am glad uh, that we're doing this conversation. And I'm actually very grateful to you because I feel like I've been a, a lone voice in the wilderness. I came out very strongly for the Arab Spring when it first started. I came out against other Jewish leaders or even pro-Israel advocates who were frightened of the Arab Spring. They didn't know what um, Pandora's box it would open. Um, but, I said, but I'm an American, and I really believe that we all have the right to be free. I believe in what's written in the Declaration of Independence, that we have inalienable rights. I never understood why we didn't think that they should um, be enjoyed by our Arab brothers and sisters, or why there wasn't an Arab George Washington. These were questions I always had. And at Oxford, you and I were able to interact with many Muslim students, many Arab students, and they were studying at a world-class university, and they were uh, immersed in Western values, and yet they were going back to countries where some of the basic rights or freedoms they enjoyed at Oxford, they can no longer enjoy as scholars that have to be afraid of censorship or worse, imprisonment, God, you know, God knows what else. So for, for a moment, let's just deal with what you just said about human nature. Arabs, Jews, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, we're all the same. We all want to be free. What's, what's going on in the Middle East? What is the nature of that democratic sure. failure? I would give you a two-part answer to that. The first is that I think the impulse to take charge of your own life and be free of oppression is a universal human impulse that's shared by everybody everywhere and is in human nature. Then there's a related question, which is, how should I govern myself once I'm not going to be oppressed? And that's a cultural question, which with different people have different ideas about. You know, democracy was a form of government that the Athenians used and decided pretty quickly they didn't like. And was then not really tried in a serious way for another almost 2,000 years until modern, Europe, modern European countries started trying it out with Great Britain being you know, the first and most prominent leader. And so it's not like human beings in that interim time didn't want to be free of oppression. They did, but a lot of them judged that monarchy was safer because of the risks associated with democracy. You know, democracy has big risks, especially associated with transitions. Monarchy is not such a great system of government because lots of kings do a bad job, but monarchy is usually pretty good at transitions because you know that there's an heir and that heir will take over. And so you avoid the panic that exists when there's no government at all, which is what happens in a failed transition. So part of the answer is that different places in the world have different cultural ideas about how you should self-govern. So that's point one. Point two is the things that have limited democracy from emerging and succeeding in the Arab world aren't actually making Go ahead. No, no, I, I don't want to interrupt. I was, I was going to say, but, but now you're saying it's cultural as opposed to being human nature. Okay, but go on. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Well, what, I'm, what I'm saying, to be very precise, is that the impulse to be free and not oppressed is human nature. But how we want to govern ourselves once we are free is not a question of human nature. It's a question of human judgment. And therefore, it's mediated through culture. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, with respect to the Arab world, the challenges that the Arab world has faced are not in any way unique to the Arab world. They're the same kinds of problems that you have elsewhere in the world where you have a combination of powerful military dictatorships and what's more, what is sometimes called the resource curse, a phenomenon where a government doesn't have to be responsible to its citizens because it's able to rely on income that comes not from taxes from a, from a cooperating citizenry, but either on oil revenues or alternatively on money that's sent from other countries that themselves have oil what are sometimes called um, rents, rent from oil, or what are called security rents that come from other countries. And so 
Some of the problems you see in the Arab world are very similar to the ones in Latin America, where for generations, dictators kept rising up. Each time there was a democratic movement, dictators would knock it down. There's been a long cyclical process. And you know, we still see this in some Latin American countries, which have a rise and a fall of their democratic institutions. They'll do very well for a few years, then a dictatorship will come back. And one of the, the Arab Spring is really the proof that there was nothing in the culture of the Arab countries that made it impossible for them to be democratic. People were interested in it and they tried. And Tunisia is the demonstration case. You know, I mean, when an Arab country, a genuine Arab country, admittedly a more secular than some Arab countries and small and relatively homogeneous, but still this Arab country successfully produced a democracy, which is still running. Is it a paradise? No, it's not a paradise. They still have high unemployment. They still have all kinds of problems. You know, in the height of ISIS, lots of young people from Tunisia, more than probably per capita from any other Arab country, went to join ISIS because no one was stopping them because the government was trying to be relatively free. So there are all kinds of serious challenges in Tunisia. But it is functioning, nevertheless, as a democracy, which shows you that it can be done. I was uh, speaking to Professor Noah Feldman. Uh, he's my dear friend from the time that we were both at Oxford. I was there as a rabbi uh, and the head of the Lachaim Society and emissary of the Lubavitch Rebbe. And Noah was there as a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, he probably doesn't want me to- I thought I was there as the Torah reader for the Lachaim Society. I thought that was my job. You were the Torah reader and my, and my study partner and my squash partner. The squash partner I was able to defeat in the early stages, and within three weeks, I can no longer beat you. But um, uh, Noah was there as a Rhodes Scholar, and uh, he, I don't think he wants to acknowledge this, because I don't know it's an official record, but he might have set the Oxford University record for the fastest ever doctorate. He did it in two years. It was unheard of. Um, most of the students who are there as Rhodes Scholars do undergraduate degrees. He did, it, he did not just a graduate degree, he did his doctorate. Okay. Uh, and it was in uh, Islamic studies, correct, uh, Noah, at Oxford? Yes, sir. Yes, it was. Okay. So I was speaking to a high ranking Israeli official who shall go nameless about your book, because I think your book's extremely important. Noah is the author of the new book, uh, The Arab Winter. Uh, obviously, um, it's about the Arab Spring and its failures in almost every place except for Tunisia and why. And I was speaking to a high ranking Israeli official uh, about your book. And he said, Well, does Professor Feldman recognize that? even if we all believe that democratization is essential in the Middle East, and that the only way to really have peace in the Middle East is through democracy, because of that well-known argument that two democracies in the history of the world have never gone to war because dictators send your kids to fight, and in a democracy you send your own kids, to, your own children to fight, so you do your best to avoid a conflict. He said, is Professor Feldman aware of the fact that you can't just have a democracy without the institutions of freedom that have to precede a democracy? So for example, when Atan Sharansky wrote his book, um, The Case uh, for Democracy, that President Bush loved so much right after the Iraqi invasion and touted and then invited uh, Natan Sharansky to, uh, to, to the Oval Office to discuss the book, apparently Natan Sharansky himself opposed the elections that took place in 2006 in Gaza with Hamas because he said, they are not yet a free society, they are a fear society. So he said any society that is not yet free, if you can't go into a public square and declare your beliefs without fear of arrest or, 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 or you know, imprisonment or, or death, then that country is not yet ready for elections because they're going to be co-opted by whoever is best organized. And he gave the example of Egypt. He said, look, in Egypt, um, Morsi and the Islamic Brotherhood were the best organized. They had institutions that existed well before the fall of Mubarak. So they therefore won the election. So it wasn't like it was a real democracy because the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to win an election in order to stop all further elections. They wanted to bring about a theocracy or something like it. So what do you think about that? You know, Israel didn't have any free institutions when it became a democracy. You know, before Israel came into existence in 1948 as a democracy, Israel was a mandatory British protectorate full of struggle and conflict between different Zionist groups, between Zionists and Palestinians, um, between the Zionists and the British, between the Palestinians and the British. And the British had not created representative democratic institutions. And yet Israel emerged as a democracy. Now, there were some self-elected groups representing Jews that they had created. Um, but they were very far from thoroughgoing institutions. They weren't, they weren't really in power. They hadn't existed for very long. India is another good example. You know, it's not as though the British in the Raj in India 
created some set of democratic institutions that then, you know, grew into the Indian democracy, that whatever its limitations and they're real, is still a functioning democracy to this day. To the contrary, the British suppressed almost every attempt by Indians to create institutions that would enable them to say, hey, British, you know, leave now because we're, good and, we're, ready, we're re good and ready for democracy. In fact, the British tried to maintain control by saying the Indians weren't ready for democracy. And it was only after World War II, when the British were deeply impoverished, that they, you know, after the struggles of the war, that they did in India and in Pakistan, pretty much what they did in Israel as well, namely to say, okay, we're out of here. You know, and it was right around the same time, 1947, 1948, the British Empire was basically crumbling and the British said, we're out of here and good luck to you guys. And in some instances like Israel and India, democracies emerged. In other instances like Pakistan, democracy really has struggled tremendously. So, you know, I think the first point is that you don't need pre-existing institutions to get a democracy. And by the way, in Tunisia, you also didn't have any great pre-existing institutions that facilitated democracy. Second point, um, you know, I don't think it's true that the Morsi government was trying to create a theocracy. That wasn't their stated policy, and that wasn't what their um, very briefly existing nascent institutions tried to do. They were struggling in part because the Constitutional Court invalidated the assembly that got elected. So then there was no legislature. So a lot of people said about Morsi, well, he's governing like an autocrat. Well, someone has to explain to me how I can govern not as an autocrat when there's no legislature. Definitionally, you're only gonna be able to govern as an autocrat at that point. Now, do they make mistakes? They made terrible mistakes. And I talk about that in the book. You know, the Brotherhood should have compromised. They should have brought in secularists. They should have brought in critics. They should have co-opted the critics into a functioning government. They didn't do those things. They sh also should not have done what they did with the constitution, which was to try to ram through a constitution that, by the way, wasn't very much more Islamic than the existing Egyptian constitution, which is now back in place. You know, people say, oh, well, it made Sharia the source of the, of the laws. Well, the existing sec quote unquote secular Egyptian constitution did the exact same thing. And that language was basically taken from the same source. So it's not like they were really trying to Islamize more than the Egyptian system was already Islamic. It's that they just did a terrible job in government and they failed to do the compromises that were necessary. So, you know, I don't think that's ultimately why, why democracy failed in Egypt. It failed because the people, enough of the people thought, we don't want Morsi. And instead of doing what they should have done, which was to vote him out of office, which would have been fine, and would have led to the perpetuation of democratic institutions, they said, we want to redo. And they went to the streets and they called for the army to come in and get rid of Morsi. And maybe some of them, maybe a few people in Egypt were naive enough to believe that if they did that, they would get a re reboot in new elections. But the reality was going to be otherwise, because those elections weren't going to include the Brotherhood, which had supporters, so it wasn't going to be free elections. They were going to suppress the Brotherhood's version of political Islam, so it wasn't going to be freedom of religion. They were going to suppress their beliefs, so that was not going to be freedom of speech. So a big shock that what then came was a new dictator, harsher than the dictator who came before. So, you know, I, I just don't think that we can say that you know, the failure in Egypt was a failure of, of institutions. It was in part that, and institutions are necessary for democracy, but you can build them as you go, because sometimes you have no choice. And Israel's a great example of that. But uh, MacArthur in Japan, uh, after the war, it took him five years before he could set up democratic institutions for something that is actually lasting. Jap Japan is a, is, is a democracy till today. Uh, the United States uh, administered uh, Germany until uh, those institutions uh, could be democratic institutions that had been destroyed by Hitler that had existed in Weimar were then uh, rehabilitated and, and, and strengthened. And there, and there are other examples. I mean, I, I, I think- Russian elections is risky. It is, ris it is risky to rush elections. There's no question. You have to be patient and you have to take your time. And the person you were speaking to was also correct that in quick elections, Islamic Democrats, people who run for office as Democrats but are Muslims and present themselves as Islamic, have a big first mover advantage. However, what you saw in Tunisia was they did better than anybody else the first time around, and then they did a little worse the next time, a little worse the next time, a little worse the next time, and eventually they said, we're not even an Islamic Democratic Party anymore. Now we're just Muslim Democrats, like European Christian Democrats. They compromised, and now they're an ordinary political party. So that's the way you have to deal with that, not say, well, you did well this time, so no more elections. Then you get another dictator. No, I... Uh... Speaking of Professor Noah Feldman, Harvard University Law School, author of an outstanding and extremely important new book uh, called The Arab Winter, and it's about democracy in the Middle East. 
you know, I see you as a lone voice in the wilderness right now. I was actually amazed that you came out with this book because it, it so saddens me that we've all but given up um, on disseminating democracy, not just in the Middle East, but almost anywhere. It's almost like that whole era, that, that little era with uh, Bush and Cheney has been so thoroughly discredited in the eyes of many that even the United States is not really trying necessarily to spread democracy. We end up both, both, both Obama and President Trump are you know, quite close to uh, Erdogan of Turkey, who has dismantled, that was an Islamic country that was a real democracy, not an Arab country, but an Islamic country. And I used to visit Turkey and I loved it. And now I was there recently and I had no Facebook and I had no Twitter. I actually saw the dismantling of freedom and I, I would feel uncomfortable visiting there, especially as I'm a critic of, of Erdogan, but we see both Democratic and Republican administrations being very close to Erdogan because um, maybe they feel they need him for NATO, and maybe they need him to accept uh, refugees from Syria. Um, we, see, we see the United States no longer really being a voice, um, especially for democracy. I, you're, you're kind of a lone voice here, even in the world of academia. Um, you got a great review in the New York Times, and that, that appeared this past Saturday. I saw it online last Wednesday, but that was in the actual newspaper. How are people receiving your message? Do they think that you're also hopelessly naive? Because I, I'm in, I agree with you. It's a very brave book, but I feel that unfortunately it's a lone voice in the world. So let me answer your question this way. You know, it's a question of what's the takeaway from the failure in Iraq and Afghanistan? You know, a lot of people think that the takeaway should be democracy isn't a good idea. To me, the takeaway is if you invade a country, and you knock out its institutions of government and you plunge it into a civil war and you then say, hey, by the way, we want it to be a democracy, that's not gonna work, that's gonna fail. And it's not so surprising that it's gonna fail when you think of the fact that democracy is by definition self-government. And if you're doing it through invasion and occupation, the people aren't really choosing it for themselves. Even if they think they're choosing it for themselves, if you're still occupying them, they can't really choose it for themselves. There's a contradiction there. That said, when it comes to countries self-governing and choosing democracy, it makes good sense for countries like the United States to be as supportive as they realistically can be under those circumstances. And by the way, that hasn't died down in the Middle East. And you, know, you see that in Sudan and Algeria, two very unfree countries with extremely rigid dictatorships, each of which in the last year in response to public protests have engaged in some reforms and some transition. Now, I don't think either of them is on its way to becoming Tunisia. Let me be really clear. I don't think either of those countries is about to become a democracy. Everyone has seen the aftermath of the Arab Spring. The protesters who are using the Arab Spring script have seen it, but so have the people with power who are going to continue to try to reestablish power the same way the government in Egypt did. So it's a very complex negotiation. But what's significant about it is it shows you that people, regardless of whether you and I are cynical or whether people in the United States are cynical or people in the US Academy are cynical, Arabs aren't cynical. Ordinary people in Algeria and Sudan who had every reason to be cynical after years and years and years of brutal dictatorship were still willing to risk their lives and go to the streets and seek change. So, you know, my, my reaction to that is maybe I am a little bit alone in the American Academy of pointing to this, but honestly, who cares what we academics think? What matters is what real people in the region think. And they clearly still believe, lots of them clearly still believe in self-government and in trying to get rid of dictators. Even if they're not convinced that American style democracy is gonna work overnight, which it probably won't, they nevertheless want genuine change. And there's something that we should honor and respect about that. And when we can, through our policies, be supportive of it, we should. We shouldn't be supporting dictators. That, and not because it's good for our foreign policy, it's the wrong thing to do to support oppressive dictatorships. It's morally okay, so wrong. I agree with you fully, but then, you and I would therefore be accused of rejecting what has what critics would say has come to, to be uh, a sound foreign policy, which is essentially Kissingerian real politics. That you can talk about all these lofty ideals about democracy and freedom, but in regions where they don't work, it's best for us to have a balance of power. We should support dictators who are allies and who can keep the peace. We shouldn't have removed Saddam Hussein, look at what it led to total collapse, you know, he was better than what, than what followed. And, and it's sad to hear those arguments, especially because we Americans are supposed to fundamentally believe the opposite. But no, look at, look, I, I think that the, 
the one stellar name in American foreign policy for the past four decades, and a new book just came out about him the other day that I just ordered, is Henry Kissinger. Because time, and he keeps on being revisited. Every time people want to reject Kissingerian realpolitik and say that, what, what an abrogation of American principles. What was America doing supporting this dictator, this dictator and that di dictator? And Kissinger, I guess, felt that his views would stand the test of time. And he continues to be this wise sage who kind of says, see, I told you so. Stop with the lofty rhetoric, no matter how much it seems to abrogate core American principles. Then, when you and I spoke the other day, I mentioned to you that in 19, when we were at Oxford together, probably in 1991, 1992, um, Francis Fukuyama came out with his book, The End of History and the Last Man. And he essentially said, okay, I'm not gonna get into whether people wanna be free innately or not. I am gonna tell you that once they are free, they never go back. That once you take taste of democracy and freedom, you never go back. And he gave the example of Weimar, that was like, you know, uh, it was a democracy followed by only 12 years of dictatorship. And then after Hitler, a democracy again. He repudiated his entire thesis. He said that Yeltsin proved, you know, there was freedom of democracy. Now we got Putin and Turkey and, and countless other places. So it really seems that the march for freedom is on the decline. Um, the march for democracy is on the decline. Dictatorships are up. And especially now in the coronavirus, where we saw the dictatorial governments were so ready, able, and, and willing to lock their countries down much more effectively because people are, and they could track people and they had lower death rates, but big open free countries like us in the United States, and those of us who are here in the New York area where you, you, know, you once taught at NYU, we've been walloped. We've been walloped because Americans are, they don't want to listen to authority. They're not going to listen to their mayors. They're not going to listen to their governors. They're not going to listen to the federal government. They're going to go to beaches. They're, they're going to say, come and arrest me, like Elon uh, Musk uh, said the other day. So, are we seeing a repudiation of freedom and democracy? Well, there's a lot there. So let me say just a few small things and then a big thing. As you know, from speaking to Frank Fukuyama, he would argue that his original book is being, has been misread, was misread even at the time. And that he was not arguing for the inevitability or the irreversibility of democratic processes. We could have a separate argument about whether he's right in his interpretation of his book or not. We both agree that an author isn't the only person who gets to interpret his work. And I totally agree that most people interpret him in the way that you say. Um, second, is democracy under threat globally today and in retreat? Yes, it is. And I would say the main reason for that is not the failures of the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan, although those contributed, but really the rise of China. You know, the, the biggest global story in geopolitics over the last 30 years is the extraordinary rise to global centrality of, of China. And if you think of Kissinger, you know, Kissinger's greatest foreign policy accomplishment on which his reputation correctly rests is that he said, well, one way the United States can get an advantage over the Soviet Union in the Cold War is to make an opening to China. But Kissinger himself will sometimes acknowledge now that it's possible that he got it backwards. Possibly we should have made an opening to Russia, the Soviet Union, in order to control China. Because it turned out that the Soviet Union collapsed, but China rose. And while Russia did not return to global superpower status, China has risen extraordinarily fast to genuine global superpower status and is challenging the United States. And the upshot of that is that all over the world, if people are thinking, should we have a democratic form of government, they look at China and they say, why? You know, you can bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and build an economy without a democracy. Why in the world would you bother to build a democracy? And that leads me to the one big thing that I want to say, and it's this. You know, to look at China and its successes, and you certainly see this in the context of um, more autocratic countries and their handling of the coronavirus pandemic, the argument for democracy as a form of government globally and in the United States, where we have our own temptations to be undemocratic, the argument cannot be that democracy will solve every problem better than autocracy. It can't be that democracy will make you rich. It might make you rich, but it might not. Some democracies are rich, some aren't. The United States is very rich. India is not very rich. India is not as rich as China, not by a long stretch. So the argument can't be that it'll make you rich. And nor can the argument be that in a crisis, democracy responds more efficiently than autocracy, because it doesn't. In a democracy, we argue, we're back and forth, we diffuse power, we have 50 governors who have viewpoints. You know, we have a whole range of institutions that are competing. We have courts that intervene, like the Wisconsin Supreme Court. 
recently intervened to strike down the Wisconsin stay-at-home order. We have a beautiful mess, or if you're Chinese, a not very beautiful mess from their perspective. But in an autocracy, you have order. And sometimes in an emergency, order seems to serve the cause. The argument for democracy has to be that democratic institutions are better morally. It has to be that even though there are costs to crisis response, and even though democracies don't know how to solve all kinds of problems, and even though democracies can't make fundamental changes sometimes that are needed, there's something better about democracy. And what is better about democracy? The only credible answer to me is that democracies on a whole do a better job of two things. They do a better job of effectuating the will of the people to take charge of their own fate, and they do a better job of protecting our fundamental rights and liberties. They don't do a perfect job of either of these things, but they do a better job than the other forms of government. And in Churchill's famous words, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. So that's a very modest chastened argument for democracy, and that's appropriate. But it is the argument we need to be making in this era. Well, that was so important that I need you to repeat that. The two best arguments of democracy, can you repeat that? The democracy on the whole does a better job than other forms of government in effectuating our popular desire, the will of the people to self-govern and not to have their fates dictated to them. That's the human nature point we were talking about before. The human desire to make your own fate and not to have somebody else make your fate for you. And then the second thing that democracies do better than other kinds of governments is protect our fundamental liberties. They don't always succeed, but they do a better job than other forms of government in having institutions like courts that stand up and say, you can't do that to me. Sometimes they go too far. I mean, to my mind, the Wisconsin Supreme Court went way too far in saying that it was unlawful for you know, the State Department of Health Services to declare a lockdown. But they did it in part out of their belief that somehow liberty was being threatened. So even though I disagree with their conclusion, I understand where they're coming from. They're coming from a place of trying to protect liberty. And that's the thing that democracies do better than other kinds of governments. You know, I loved seeing you at your home uh, in Cambridge with your children. You're an amazing father. I've seen you with your kids uh, when they were smaller and now when they're older. Um, so I feel guilty about taking you away from your kids. <laughs> Really fine. We're all on our Zoom. You know, you know what how it is right now. You know, you have lots of lots of wonderful kids yourself. They they're on their Zoom. I'm on my Zoom. And the, the best thing from their perspective is for the first time in their lives, I'm not constantly giving them a hard time about being on social media. Now I'm like, okay, that's the only way you're gonna see your friends. So go for it. So I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, so I want to make a final point. First of all, Noah, um, I want to thank you uh, immensely for your decades of friendship. Uh, and I want to say here on this lasting uh, broadcast, uh, just how much your friendship means to me. What a gentleman and a mensch you have been through all these years. Um, I think you have really kept uh, your values and uh, your sense uh, of, uh, of purpose of what you've wanted to accomplish. And with this book, maybe perhaps more than even your other outstanding books, um, this book on, on the Arab winter and Arab democracy, because this is, I, I agree with everything you said about the moral argument, but the final point, point, having thanked you, there was one final thing, and maybe we'll need a whole other evening just to discuss this, but you said that the first argument for democracy is that it's the best form of government to help us achieve our own desire to kind of be self-governing. Um, and yet the other day I said to you that um, Eric Fromm, who was one of Freud's principal disciples, he wrote this book called uh, Escape from Freedom. And he kind of says the exact opposite. He kind of says, for, for the longest time, we, especially Americans, have said people want to be free. They want to make their own choices. He said it's, it's not true. And he, and, he, and he uses Christianity as an example. I'm not saying that I agree with his critique of Christianity, but he says that Christianity is a fundamentally disempowering religion insofar as it says you can't get to heaven on your own. You have to get there through the faith in Jesus. You can't ever be righteous. Again, uh, you're always fallible and you're sinful and you can only repose faith in the, the savior who died on a cross. And you don't really have choice. You know, in, in Calvinism, you truly have no choice at all. Um, but you don't really, and, and I see this beginning to permeate this idea, the lack of choice, uh, not just in the rise of dictatorships. I see it in biological uh, predeterminism and genetics that tell us that we're, we, are, we have far less choice than we would otherwise suppose. We're genetically predisposed to certain actions, let's say even uh, infidelity or non-monogamy in marriage. Uh, 
I see it in, um, um, I see it in, uh, uh, what other examples can I give? I mean, certainly in, 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 in governments in the direction that we're headed, but I, but I even see it in, I, I told you on the phone, as a marriage counselor, um, arranged marriages are so much more successful than, than statistically, than Western romantic marriages. Um, that choice may not be working for all of us. It, it, you and I are Jewish, and Judaism emphasizes over and over again, your choice can never be taken away from you. But then we have many social anthropologists who would say that people really don't have choice that their economic circumstances, that whether their parents, um, you know, how they were raised, their gender, their socioeconomic status. Choice is really under threat. So my final question to you is, why do you think, therefore, it's still so important? You said the first reason for democracy is that we want to kind of choose how to live, and democracy is the best form of government to give that to us, to empower us. Before I answer, I just want to say right back at you, um, you know, you are one of the most loyal friends I have ever had in my life. And I'm someone who values my friendships and I still have many of my closest friends from when I was a child and when I was a student in the various institutions I studied in and, and in Oxford. And, and um, I really deeply value the fact that we're still friends after all these years and I hugely value your support and, and your loyalty. And Thank you. I'm really grateful for that. Um, Eric Fromm, who by the way was raised from, um, there's a, a great passage in um, uh, Gershom Sholem's memoir where he talks about uh, the great st student of the Kabbalah who was not raised religious himself, that when he was a teenager and he hung out in a group of young intellectuals with Eric Fromm, they had a little rhyme about Eric Fromm where they would say, make me like Eric Fromm, that into heaven I may come. So they, they actually made fun of a guy whose name was Fromm, which means Fromm, which means religious, for the fact of his name. Um, and uh, in his psychoanalysis, from psychoanalysis with the, an analyst whom he subsequently married, she was the analyst, he was the patient, and then they got married, he eventually moved away from his religious faith. Fromm was a very brilliant psychoanalyst. I don't think he was a very brilliant political theorist. And I don't think that psychoanalysis and political theory are the same undertaking. I think they're very different undertakings. Um, and the nature of what is choice is different in the political dimension than it may be in the individual dimension. And the person whom I'm much more influenced by, and he's also was also a contemporary of these great German Jewish figures of the interwar years and post-war years, is the philosopher Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt, and I use Hannah Arendt's work a lot in this book. Hannah Arendt argued that the essence of what makes us human beings who can act collectively, notice that it's about the collective. Psychoanalysis is usually about the individual, and political theory is about the collective that the essence of what makes us humans who can act collectively is our ability to make collective decisions about how we're going to govern ourselves. She herself was drawing on the Aristotelian idea that what makes humans unique is not that we're social. There are lots of social animals. You know, primates are social animals, bees are social animals, there are lots of social animals. Penguins, for that matter, are social animals. What makes us unique is that we're political animals, political in the sense that we make constitutions. We make systems of government that systematically work for us. And if you believe that that's part of what makes us distinctively human, as I do, and as Aristotle argued and as Arendt argues, then it's our capacity to form those judgments as a group that enables us to most fully express our genuine humanity. And that's why the choice part of it matters. Sure, there are circumstances where we have too much choice and where we can't handle the choice we have because choice is risky. Choice can go wrong. And here I'm thinking of your, your example of an arranged marriage. You know, I, I have nothing against arranged marriages. If they work for people and no one is coerced into them, then I think they're fine. But a marriage by choice is much higher risk, as you say, it might go wrong. And that's why it's noble and extraordinary when it works, because it has the capacity to go. Love is like that. You know, romantic love at least is like that. You know, you enter into romantic love, it might not work out. And the same is true with collective self-government. And we saw this in Egypt. You know, what was extraordinary and noble is that the Egyptian people were trying to do the thing that is self-government and they failed. That possibility of failure is part of what makes the undertaking noble in the first place. It doesn't guarantee success. It's not given to you by somebody else. It's the human being autonomous. It's man making choices collectively, men and women making choices collectively for themselves. 
So to me, that remains the essence of what political life should be. And I'm moved by it when I see it and I value it, but I know at every moment that it can go wrong. And that, that's okay. That's part of what it is to try to do the most noble thing you can do in the political realm as, as human beings. Okay, I hope that your message uh, spreads wide and far. I hope that this book is a huge success, published by Princeton University Press. Uh, Professor Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School, world-renowned constitutional expert and the author of this n incredible new book, uh, The Arab Winter. Noah, uh, again, I wanna thank you for your friendship. I'm sorry to take your time at night. Um, keep, please t apologize to your kids for <laughs> not, not at all. They, they were happy to, happy to be rid of me for an hour. <laughs> so, uh, you're one of the few students, I had many students at Oxford and I cherished all of those friendships. But you, I learned so much from you uh, and I continue to learn so much from you. And I think what you've done with this book is actually translate the ancient wish of the Hebrew prophets for this, a world where there isn't oppression and where human dignity is established into a political system, hopefully, that can be, uh, that can be um, done in our time. And it's, it is a very important voice. And it's a voice against all the cynicism that has come to replace the idealism that we had just a few years ago and that what America is supposed to stand for and what America is, it, what are, the land of the free and the home of the brave, that's, that's what we're supposed to be. So thank you very much. God bless you, and um, I hope the book is a huge success. Professor Noah Feldman, the Arab winter. God bless you.